this is? Round of applause. This is a round of applause. <laughs> Praise the Lord. If you open up your Bibles to the book of Romans, we're going to stay here for the remainder of the service, which is going to be only... I'm going to get us out of here by 8.30. Oh, you laughing, brother? Is that a challenge? Do you hear that? <laughs> okay. I'm getting good now. I'm getting good at this. I've been, I got us out early on Sunday. We were out. Well, plenty of time for me to bring my son back home. Praise God. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. If you've been through a Bible study, you've been through this portion of Scripture. I talk about it all the time. This is part of the kingdom Bible study that involves the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Uh, that is the third Bible study of the kingdom Bible study. And it is demonstrating to us the requirement of having the Spirit of God in order to be saved, which is rarely taught. I'm going to say it again. It is rarely taught in the church. Or in churches. The requirement of having the Holy Spirit. But that's not the, the whole purpose of, I'm not focusing on that today, but we're going to go over that. But we're still talking about the idea. We're going to talk about it for a while as far as I know. We're still talking about the destiny of the church. Where are we supposed to be going? Where are we heading? And right now the area that we're talking about is having that love affair with God. I feel like the Lord is, is, is leaning me towards obedience and that's probably the next area. We probably have one more sermon about love affairs with God and his love towards us, which will be Sunday and I think we're going to go on to obedience. I think that's where the Lord is guiding me. And I've also done some uh, research and listening to the camp meeting videos from uh, camp meeting this last summer and it's given me lots of... Uh, lots of what we call nuggets of information for preaching, preaching notes. Um, I told you we had those a long time ago, but I've had so much that I've had to preach before that, but it's still there for me. Anybody want to have a love affair with God? I, I want to I just be in love. I, I just want to be goofy in love with God. And so that's how we're, how we're going to move forward in this idea of a love affair of God. Uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says there is... Therefore now, no condemnation. No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free. Someone say free. Someone say liberty. Made me free from the law of sin and death. You're free from that. Then it goes on to say in verse 3, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That's how much he loves you. Verse 5, I've got a little bit to go and then we'll stop. Verse 5 says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Where your mind is, is where you're going to go. Where your attitude and your mind leads you, and where you're focusing on, that's going to get stronger in your life. So if your mind is on the flesh, the flesh is going to grow in your present body. It goes on to say, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. If you focus on spiritual things, which is why we come to church, read our Bibles, pray, get involved with the church functions and the, and the service to the church. It's because those are spiritual. And we become more spiritual when we focus on spiritual things. Verse 6 says, for to be carnally minded is death. Look to your neighbor and say, I want to live. Mm. But to be carnally minded is death. I don't know anybody who wants to die. And if they do, it's because they're not healthy. It's not a, a healthy thing to say, I want to die. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Wow. Who doesn't want that? I want life. And I want peace in my life. Then it goes on to say in verse 7, Because the carnal mind is enmity or enemies against God, 
For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The carnal mind can't be in line with the laws of God. So verse 8 says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. They cannot please God. No matter how hard you try, if you're going to be in the flesh, you're going to do fleshly things. It says that the righteous of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the spirit, but after the flesh. I don't know why that says four there. Verse 9 says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to the church. He says, you're not in the flesh. He is, he's making mention of that struggle between the flesh and the spirit. But he gives an indication that the church should not be in that struggle. The church is in the spirit. You're not in the flesh and you're in the spirit. And it says, if so that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. When you have the Holy Ghost... You are not in the flesh. You're in the spirit. And then it says, Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Let's pray. <clears throat> Jesus, we're here today to, to receive our midweek feeding. We're, we're here to continue our understanding of how to be in a love affair with you. We're here to strengthen our spirit and our spiritual walk and, and to cause weakness in our flesh and to let our flesh become submitted and under the power of the Spirit in our bodies. That's one of the ways that we're going to demonstrate our love to you. And we ask right now that you would continue to let us lean on you and, and to trust in you to guide us in that right place. To have that love affair with you. In Jesus' name and the church said amen. Let's just clap onto the Lord one more time. Oh, he is awesome. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So we went through all that. I'm just, I'm not going to reread it, but I just want to, I want to just look through it again. It makes it very clear. It makes it very clear. Our responsibility, our focus. Now, if you're in this church, I believe you're blessed because you're not going to get this teaching in most places in town. And I'm not judging them. I'm not trying to put them down. I'm just telling you that that's the fact. That is a fact. I've been to these other places in town, and they do not teach this thing uh, that, is, that is so important to God. Now, there may be some that, that touch on it, and, but, the, but the idea of the importance of fighting sin with all that you have. See, when you're in a relationship with someone that you love, are you willing to fight for them? Brother Randy, if someone walked up to your wife and began to scream obscenities in her face and began to reach out to do bodily... <laughs> exactly. He may need that someday. Uh, I can just only imagine... The level of fight that will begin to build up inside of you. You got to be willing to fight when you love something. You want to protect those things when you're in love with something. Well, guess what? I want to be in love with God. And if there's something that's going to jeopardize or threaten my relationship with God, there's going to be a fight. There better be a fight. Let me give you an example. There is going to be this thing called Satan. And I said thing. I didn't say person because he's a thing to me. He is this, this, this enemy, this attacker. He's going to come after you. He's going to come after your wife, your husband, your children, your grandchildren. This enemy wants to destroy and that's his purpose. If you're going to be in a love affair with God, you had better get yourself so full of God's power that you are able to put on, you know, wouldn't it be the most terrible thing? Wouldn't it be the most terrible thing to be in a position of being so weak that you can't fight for the one that you love? 
That person is there being attacked and needing your help. And you, you, you just can't, you, you don't have the strength. There's nothing worse than being bound and watching the ones that you love be under attack. Nothing, I can't think of, I can't think of anything worse than, than people that I love, like my family or my children, being under attack by someone and me being unable to come to the rescue. Oh my goodness. I gotta, I, I'm thinking of something I got to share with you after. Let me get back to this. We're in a position in ourselves, in our lives, if we're going to have a love affair with God, we need to have a constant readiness to fight sin. That sin is going to come between us and God. And if we allow it to, it's going to cause us all kinds of havoc. Now my question to you is, do we need to go through that havoc? Is it preventable? Absolutely. How do we know that? Because the Word of God tells us that it's preventable. The law of Christ makes us free. Now, if you allow yourself to get in sin and put in bondage, is that, is that God's fault? That's our responsibility to stay free from sin. It goes on to tell us the battle between the sin and the flesh. We know this is true. We know this is going to happen. So it's not, a, it's not a secret. It's not a trick the enemy can put on you. We absolutely know what he's going to do and how he's going to do it. We have, we have a perfect knowledge of our own lives. We have a perfect knowledge. Listen, I want you to just think for a second. How does the devil try to get me? And I, don't raise your hands, but just think about it. I bet you could already come up with two or three things in your life that he already has used on a regular basis to try to take you down. It's not a secret. Now, I'll even tell you what's better. And I told this to my leadership the other day. We have this omnipresent God. Now, the, the, the devil is not omnipresent. He is not everywhere present. He cannot continue to take a... Uh, 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 a position of knowing everything when he's coming after you. But conversely, this is fun. Just think about this for a minute. When, when the devil's in his boardroom with his imps and his demons and devils, when he's planning his attack, somebody hear me. <laughs> when he is planning his attack with them, do we have an omnipresent God? Is he everywhere present? You know what that means? Well, the devil's at the round, his little table with his imps and his demons and devils sitting there. Oh, really? Okay, so our God is sitting there watching him the whole time. He knows, ex come on, somebody. He knows exactly the offense that he's going to put on you. So he knows exactly what angels to send your way. He knows exactly how to protect you. He knows exactly what to do to keep you from harm's way. <laughs> I love that. Would it be wonderful if you had a Super Bowl team and they knew every play that the offense was going to, you're on offense and you know every play, I'm sorry, you're on defense, you know every play that the offense is going to run. That's why they keep their playbook separate, their secret. But okay, he's going to go in this pocket. Okay, guys, this pocket right here, okay? You don't have to worry about nothing else but that pocket right there. Okay, guys, let's go. Hut. Bam! Can't go. Can't do anything because we know the play. And then you're on offense, and you know every defensive play that the other team is going to, oh, they're going to do a blitz. Okay, so we're going to just do a quick drop and touchdown. Oh, they're going to be spread. Okay, we're going to run the ball. Every, you know, every defensive play. So you know, you know exactly what to do. It's the same thing with God. He knows every play. He knows every trick. He knows everything that the devils and demons are going to try to do to hurt you. Aren't you glad that you're on God's team? <laughs> Aren't you glad you're on the winning team? Aren't you glad you're on the team that's going to make it to the Super Bowl every single year? Praise God. Wouldn't that, wouldn't, wouldn't that be a team you'd want to be on? If, if, if you had all these teams and this team was going to win the Super Bowl every year, everybody would want to be on the team. But it's so amazing how many people don't want to be on God's team. 
It's so amazing how many people reject God when it's the best team in the world to be on. Then we go on to understand, and I, and I reiterate this because it's so important, there is this mindset in what I call modern day Christianity, or what's generally called uh, in, in our circles, in apostolic circles, modern day Christianity, which is meaning that it's been changed from what it's supposed to be, that sin is a normal part of your life. But here there's another scripture that shows us clearly that if you're in the flesh, you can't please him. So how is it that I can be in sin but still be okay with God? It's impossible. He equips you with what you need to please him. And being in sin is not part of that, that plan. So then we go into the idea of the necessity of having the Holy Ghost. Remember we started last week in the book of Romans that talked about that's how God shows his love. He, he pours out his love in our hearts through the Holy Ghost. That is how our love affair begins. Now, that's where the affair begins. Or that's where the relationship begins when you're full of the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name and repentant of your sins. But understand, that doesn't mean there wasn't no flirting going on before. Usually perfect strangers don't get together and jump into a relationship. See, that's where faith, grace, and that idea of believing and accepting comes in. But people say, well, that's, they say that's the, the end all, the be all. You accept and you're saved. But that's just the flirting with God. That's just getting in touch with God. Under, recognizing God. Recognizing that that might be something that I want. See, that's the flirting with God part. That's not the relationship. There are so many people that think when they've accepted Christ that they're in a relationship with God and they're just flirting with God. They haven't even jumped into that intimacy yet. We talked about intimacy with God in the preaching a few months ago. I don't know how many, maybe a year ago. But that Holy Ghost or that Holy Spirit is the beginning. It's the contact. It's the intimacy. Most of us are adults here, so I've said this before, but I, I, the Bible often refers to uh, God and his relationship with us as husband and wife. And that intimacy, the, the getting to know or the making love with God is that same idea of being filled with his spirit. How can you have a love affair with God without having a spirit? What's the answer? You can't. You cannot have a love affair with God without having his spirit. Now, fortunately, I'm basically giving you a background of why in this church. Immediately, the first thing we talk about with people is repentance. You got to repent. And then either baptism or getting filled with the Holy Ghost in either order is immediately the focus. I actually was received criticism from somebody at one point that said, Oh, you try to push people and rush people into baptism. Yes! I mean, I would use the word more encouraging. I don't say get in that water or else. You don't get in that water. You can't come to this church. You know, I mean, we don't do that. But we encourage people, listen, that water is important. There's something that happens when you go into that water. And it's not the water that does it, but the blood of Jesus Christ. But yes, we encourage. Hey, you got to, because why? You need to be in that relationship. You need to be in that relationship. There are things that are, that are important about that portion of a relationship. But we're going to go on to verse 10 where it says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Let me give you an, just another uh, mindset. When you become someone um, who, who's in a relationship that's committed, oh, I use the C word, commitment. When you're in a committed relationship with someone, do you continue to go out and keep dating everybody else? I mean, you can, but they got words for people like that. I won't repeat them, but they're out there. It's the same thing with this concept that I want to try to put in your mind. When you're in Christ and you're in that relationship, when you're full of his spirit, if you continue in sin, you are cheating on God. Come on. You find yourself betraying God. What I'm trying to get the church to understand by this portion of scripture is how to maintain, not only to start and build, but maintain your love affair with God. One of the best ways to break up a relationship is to have someone go out and cheat on the other person. That destroys relationships. 
Now, fortunately, those relationships can be repaired. It's the same thing with God. If you'll do what? If you repent of your sins, God is faithful to forgive you and, and allow you to stay in relation with him. It's the same thing with people. I've seen people who are, and it's funny because the world usually is more forgiving than people in the church, which is kind of strange. You know, someone in the church will have someone, might have an affair, and, and boom, they're done, get out. But you're in the world, you cheat on them ten times. And they still stay with you. And it's, isn't that crazy? But the fact of the matter is, um, in this subject, is the idea of repairing the relationship is through repentance. If you're really sorry, you will actually stop the behavior of getting involved with extramarital relationships. If you're not, then you'll continue to do that, but you'll be demonstrating a lack of repentance. Now, if you do that over and over and over and over again, what does God do? First, let's talk about a person. If you continue to go out and cheat on someone, but keep saying sorry and they keep taking you back over and over and over again, what does that person who's being cheated on eventually do? Right? For the fellowship. See ya. And they're rightly so. They should do that. Because that person is demonstrating not only their lack of repentance, but it also becomes a health issue. You don't know if you, you know, if you're healthy, if what you you know what they're doing with people who and you just it's, it's, it becomes even dangerous. But the idea of God, what happens when you keep saying God, I'm sorry, and going back to sin, and you keep cheating on God over and over again? Does that build your love affair with God? It does very much the same as it does in a regular, uh, secular or physical relationship. It causes destruction. The reason why I'm telling you this, come on, somebody hear me. The reason why I'm telling you this is we spiritually tend to think that we can do this and it'd be okay with God. We, we do things that we couldn't do in the physical, in the spiritual, and, and think that somehow it's okay. But if we did the same thing in a, spirit, a physical connotation, it just doesn't work. Well, the fact is, it's probably very similar in the spirit. It just doesn't work. Let me tell you what God will do. Do you know what God will do? After over and over and over of, of, of true lack of repentance, what's he going to do? Anybody? He'll send you a strong mind. A, uh, he'll send you a strong illusion. You believe a lie. What else? That's part of being a what? It's starting to come out now. Having a... No, this is the bad part. If you continue over and over again to, to, to sin, to cheat on God, to be unwilling to stay repentant, say sorry, but keep doing the same thing over and over again, he can send you a strong delusion that you would believe a lie, and he can send you a what? It's called a something mind. He'll give you a reprobate mind. Or a seared conscience where you could just be doing the wrong thing over and over again and you think you're doing right. You would even fight, you could even be teaching what's right and doing what's wrong and not even be able to recognize it. Reprobate mind. Once you're there, unless he releases you, you're pretty much through. Because just like Saul, if he sends an evil spirit, if it's from the Lord, then the only thing that can get rid of it is the Lord. The Lord sent you that spirit. That's what happened to Saul. Read, read it closely. It was an evil spirit that he received that was from the Lord. So who, who's, who could pray that out? Who could pray that out? God's the one that gave it to him. God's going to be the one to take it out. Are going to have to be. But see, it's, it's my understanding. This is not Bible. This is me searching the scripture and trying to understand it. It appears to me that if God sent you that spirit, and I might have said this the other day. I don't know if I was telling my wife and some other people or if I preached it. But if God sends you that spirit, he probably did so because he knows the beginning and the end. See, we have a just God and we have a God who, who, who doesn't want you to fail. He doesn't want you to go to hell. He doesn't want you to be destroyed. So he wants you to succeed. But if he, the same one that said, would I send you a scorpion when you ask for bread? Or would I give you a snake or a serpent when you ask for things that will take care of you? Would I do that? He said no. 
read your Bibles. I may have messed up the serpent or the snake or, but, but, or, or the scorpion, but he talked about, you know, am I going to give you a rock when you ask for bread? Or I don't know exactly all, you'll have to read, read it. But when we ask for things of life, is he going to give us death? It says no. So if that being true, if God is going to send that spirit, then he must know that that person is never really going to repent. That person is never really going to live for God. And, and, and he knows the beginning of the end. So he can send that spirit and not be wrong because my God can never be wrong. You can't put God ever on the stand and say, you have done the wrong thing. And we're now going to charge you, God, because you have done wrong. If he sent that spirit to Saul, then it was right. So if we're going to continue, and I'm going to tell you, church, uh, I should start to hear, I'm hearing from more people asking for more advice and, and asking me for what is known as permission instead of uh, forgiveness or, or asking questions. But understand we should have a level of fear about this. We should be doing a lot of self-evaluation about this. What is it in my life that I continue to do that's against God that demonstrates my lack of faithfulness to him? Now, I'm not faithful to God. If I'm going to, if he, was he, well, let me ask, was Jesus faithful to us? How did he show that faithfulness? Somebody tell me. How did Jesus, you be quiet. Yes. Ooh, well, hey, that's my daughter right there. He was faithful to die on the cross and take on the sins of the world. Jesus has never cheated on you. He has never cheated on you. Not once. What I want to know is if there are any cheaters in here. If there's any unfaithful people in here. Uh, brothers, your first time, boy, you got a good day to go. <laughs> Are there any? How am I cheating on God? If so, if not, then you should be praising God and say, you know, I love, I used to be at a church where I was sitting there and when the pastor was preaching, 99% of the time, he was looking, I'm like, yeah, because I was doing what he said. I was walking in line with God. So I had a reason to be excited. So if you're doing what I'm saying, if you're in a position where you're not cheating on God, boy, that should feel good. You should feel like, wow, I am doing what God asked me to do. And I can be faithful. I can have faith in God that when I go through something, I'm going to be all right because God's got my back. I haven't cheated on him. Let me ask you something. When you cheat on your spouse or a girlfriend or, or a boyfriend and then you need their help, somebody hear me. <laughs> you just cheated on them boldly and said you know I, I, I've heard this you know I don't know why a man would even say this even if he meant even if it was true I don't love you anymore I'm going to do my thing and then you come back and now you need something but you've been unfaithful how how available is that pe person that's been victimized by your cheating? How are they there to, oh, sure, how can I help you? They're like, oh, 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 now I'm beautiful. <laughs> oh, before, I don't love you all, but now I'm beautiful. Now you want me. <laughs> but what about that person? What about that person who you've been faithful to? Who you've been there for? And you have been supportive and, and you have been in that committed relationship. And then you fall down hard. Let me tell you something. You need help. That person, if it's a healthy person in a healthy relationship, they are there to pick you up. They're there to take care of you. They're there to get you through. They're supportive and they love you. And they're right there with you. Because you've been faithful. It's no different with God. You've been cheating on God. You've been doing the wrong thing. And then you want to go, oh God, help me. You know what's crazy? This, is, this should really open up your eyes. Even though we've been cheating, there are times when God says, I'm still going to help you. That's how much I love you. I'm still going to pick you up and put you on your feet and see what you're going to do because of how much he loves you. The question is, how are we going to respond to that? Now, let's get down to the nitty-gritty. Uh, 
It says, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So when you're full of the spirit, that's when you're going to be faithful. Well, let me me back up. That's when you're supposed to be faithful. So let's talk about some of the areas that I'm talking about in terms of cheating God. Someone tell me a way that you can cheat God or cheat on God. Not paying your tithes. How else? Yes. Not praying. How how close are you going to be with someone you don't talk to? Oh, I love God and you ain't talked to him in a month. I tell you, if I didn't talk to my wife in a month, my, all my stuff would be outside. Yes, how could you cheat on God? Not getting baptized. There are people, not many in this church, but there are people who don't get baptized for the strangest reasons. The biggest one is because they're afraid they're going to mess up again. And Sunday I actually answered that. What was the, what was the answer? Huh? Yeah, I promise you you're going to mess up. Because you're not perfect. But the more full of God you are and the more faithful you are, you're going to mess up less. So, not paying your tithes, not praying, not reading your Bible. What did she say? Not getting baptized. How else? Yes, children. Come into church on the right. There's a lot of cheaters right now. Someone's cheating on the Lord. Oh, if you're watching, I love you. I'm just preaching. And you should watch this because you're a cheater. (laughs) You're cheating right now. You're on a date with something else other than God. When God's waiting for you at the dinner table. Oh, come on, somebody. This is a dinner table. You were invited to dinner. This was your date. And you turned them down and left them sitting at. Oh, you're almost a bosh. (laughs) I love when God does that. You left them hanging. Here it is. Now that's okay. I mean, uh, the people are sick and all this kind of stuff. And, and you know what? I'm very understanding as a pastor. But guess what? I'm not the one you need to be worried about. Ooh, praise God. I'll say that to you guys out there. I'm understanding. You'll call me up and say, um, this happened, that happened, and what I'll say. Okay, well, we'll see you. Hope we can get here next time, whatever. I'm not going to rebuke you. But what, what's he He is the one you should be afraid of. Me, I'm going to love you anyway. This church is going to be open. The doors are going to be open. The the pews are going to be here. I'm going to be here. I don't care if it's me and my wife and my three kids. Well, four. We're going to be here. Now, I'm glad that all y'all have made a decision to be here. But if you weren't here for anything but a really good, God knows, you know, you can tell me all your stories all you want to, but God knows what really happened. And some of the stories are true. But some of them are fabricated or exaggerated or you just fill in the blanks. I want to have a love affair with God. Listen, I'll tell you what, when I'm in love, if there's a, if there's, look, okay, I'm single now, okay, just pretend like when, I'll take the ring off for a minute. <laughs> See what she said. No, okay. Let's just pretend I'm single for a second. Wait for the bell to come out. Whoosh. Pretend I'm single for a second. There's, there's some woman out there I'm in love with. I'm in love with her. <laughs> you see how she's handling And I love my wife. A lot of women were like, <laughs> and she says, you know, why don't you meet me over here at a certain time? Man, I can't wait for the time. Woo! I can't, six o'clock, I'm going. I'm going to see her. Yes, I can't wait. You think I'm going to, oh, just not show up? If I don't show up, that means I'm really not that interested in seeing her. Well, we got two dates for all people who are having a love affair with God every Wednesday and Sunday. We don't even have two services on Sunday. And it's at 3 o'clock. You can sleep in, drink your coffee, read the paper, catch the first game. Easy. I'm here to tell you, church, if you're going to have a love affair with God. Now, I'm, I'm, you guys are already here, and you guys are, are, are generally the ones that are always here. And, and so, in many respects, you should be very excited saying, he's not talking about me, because I'm here. I'm here all the time. I'm here on a regular basis. Praise God. 
in this church, and this is very similar to love the Lord all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and I don't know if that's wise for me. I mean, after everybody, a bunch of people left after I preached that. And this is very similar to that. But this is what God gave me to give. I know that there is a God, and his name is Jesus. And even though he's not here manifested like he did to the apostles, I know he's just as real. And I'm in love with him. It sounds so strange saying I'm in love with a guy, but, but I'm in love with Jesus. And Jesus is in love with me. You know, you ever read, read your Bibles. You ever read the, the, uh, the love between Jonathan and David? There, there is so intimate, intimate. The, the relationship is so strong in terms of loving each other, I believe is brotherly love, but it's so deep that many people want to mistake it or classify it as a homosexual relationship in the Bible. Now we know that's not true. I mean, that's just ridiculous because obviously God said there shouldn't be homosexual relationships. So for him to then create, you know, uh, a man who is after his own heart and be in a homosexual relationship, that's just, that's foolish. But, but that's the level of love between those two individuals. Both godly men. Especially David being after God's own heart. Okay. Oh my goodness. I might have to cut this short. Okay. Verse 11 says, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you, that's the Holy Ghost. Basically, that's just saying, if you have the Holy Ghost. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Now, wait a minute. I thought Jesus brought life. He did bring life. But if you're in the flesh, you don't have Jesus. If you're going to continue to cheat on him, he's going to dump you. Oh, come on. Did I just say that? But that's the truth. See, that's what people don't want to believe. And that's why people are so, so stuck in their relationships with sin. If I felt like my girlfriend was never... Now I'm married again, okay? Babe, we're married again. Okay. But... Uh, <laughs> You know, being in the flesh, being a man, if I felt like my wife was going to stay with me no matter what I did, if I continued to do whatever I want, she was going to stay, stay with me, that would be a harm to our relationship because my flesh might get the best of me and I might find myself doing stuff over and over again because she's never going to go. I promise you, if I continue to do whatever I want in sin, this woman will say, bye, see ya. <laughs> she made that very clear she, she had someone like that before that's not what she's in this for she's in this for a man who's going to live for God and if I'm not going to do it she's not going to stay with me it's the same thing with God if you are not and he says it over and over again how the sin comes between you and him if you're going to continue on in the flesh he is going to dump you and it, it doesn't make sense and in a physical relationship I mean I know it doesn't always match physical and spiritual but there are many that do it doesn't make any sense to think that we could go on just cheating and cheating and cheating and think that God's just going to take it from us a woman wouldn't. Even the greatest woman with the most patience who's been cheated on over and over again eventually has her limit. And, and men, boy, don't ever get to that lim limit with a woman because once she's done with you, it's over. Women are like that. It's over. You can come crying and whining and gifts. It's over with a woman. With men, uh, it depends. <laughs> Verse 13, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you live, uh, but if you, ye through the spirit do mortally mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Anybody want to live? <clears throat> I want life and I want it more abundantly. I'm, I've had plenty of death in my life. I'm not interested in dying to, 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 because of my sin. Oh, I've lived that empty life. I'm over it. Some of us need to get over it. We need to get over that old life. Some of us have and, and, and are happy because of it. Praise God. Okay. I got No, actually, I'm not doing that one. So I've only got one more because I figured that I'd have to save this one for Sunday, these two, uh, which is Psalms 40. So verse 14 says, Let them be ashamed and confounded together. 
that seek after my soul to destroy. I'm sorry, I knew that was the wrong one. That was Romans. I'm sorry, Psalms. Verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. When you are led by the Spirit, that's when you're in the family. If you're led by the flesh, you're not in the family. And that's something that we need to make clear because that's going to change, what do we say? How we think is going to determine how we what? How we feel. And how we feel is going to determine how we act. And if we think that we can go on sinning and be okay with God, guess what? We're going to feel some confidence in our sin and we're going to sin. Somebody hear me. If you didn't catch anything else, catch what I'm about to say right now. But if we think that we're required in order to be in a relationship with Him, to have a loving relationship, a faithful, committed relationship with God, if we think that we have to be committed and faithful and stay away from sin, we're going to feel fear about sin. And we're going to stay away from it, which is maintaining repentance. That will be our action. That's why we've got so many churches full of so much sin and, and accepting sin because people aren't afraid of sin anymore. We in this church are going to be afraid. That's a healthy fear. Now some of the whole pastor, but the Bible says God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. You're right. When I'm repentant, living for God, I don't have to be afraid. But if I'm not living for God, I better be very afraid. Verse 15 and we're done. Let's stand. Mm, baby, you can come up. After the scripture, I am going to have an altar call because I believe the Lord is, is really giving us a vision, a mindset that should change our feelings and our feelings should lead to a good action. <clears throat> For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Didn't I just say that? <laughs> God does not give us a spirit of bondage again to fear, being bound by fear. But we have, ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Abba, Father is a sacred, proper name for the Father. Abba, Father. That's like saying, great and glorious Father or wonderful father it's a, but it's a proper in the Hebrew a proper name or I'm sorry in the Greek probably Abba father when you've received the spirit of God the Bible says it leads you to all truth when I preach I don't want you to think this is for the other guy this is for my neighbor. This is for someone across from me. I want this to be, this is for me. When I'm preaching it to you, I am preaching that it is for me. See, there are some things that I've gotten rid of. See, I don't battle with faithfulness to the house of the Lord. Never have to worry about that. I'm going to be here if nobody's here. I don't battle with uh, sin. I repent. I stay repentant. If something happens to creep up, I kick it out. I stay repentant. I don't bother with that. That's not a problem. I don't have a problem with reading and praying. Now, of course, it's always a challenge to maintain it and at higher levels, but I, don't, I, I know the importance of reading and praying and I do it. Now, there are areas that I may, you know, I may watch too many movies. Now, this Netflix thing. Just when I got good at hardly watching any movies at all, then we get Netflix. Oh, Lord. Thanks. <laughs> it's like having cable, for goodness sake. It is. I can go on and get any number of TV shows and movies, and I can even stop one and go back and watch another one, and it'll actually take me right to where I left off. I don't have to rewind or fast forward. Good Lord. There are areas that I need to, need to work on. Uh, there was a guy who, at Walmart the other day who was brothers with somebody who, who probably doesn't like me and, and looked at me, and, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he goes, what? I went, what? You got beef? 
So first of all, in the 80s we use that word, beef. <laughs> but what I said next, I probably shouldn't have said. My wife said, you probably shouldn't have said that. And I said, well, you are beef. Because <laughs> he's a big old giant guy. And he, for him to use beef probably wasn't the wisest choice of words. <laughs> and then he looks at me and goes, you N I G G E R M O T H U mother I mean F word bomb and and right in front of my kids and my wife. I was about from here to there and he shouted that at me. You and now I'm grateful to have the Holy Ghost. Because if I didn't, I would have told my wife to politely go and check out and I would have instructed that gentleman to meet me outside. <laughs> and him and I would have had words and fists to cuffs and everything else. But I got the Holy Ghost today. But you know, maybe I shouldn't have said he was beef. <laughs> but I mean, beef to that is a big jump. But you know, you know what I said to him? And this made him look foolish because, see, he is screaming obscenities and racial slurs. And I looked back at him and said... Lord bless you. You have a nice day and walked away. It was so crazy what he said. He looked ridiculous. But I need, I need to work on me. I mean, uh, I'm not what God wants me to be yet. I mean, I think I'm, I'm fighting to get there, but you know, I'm not where God wants me yet. But oh well, he done some work though. I know, I know God was happy with me. I didn't do what I wanted to do. My flesh had some ideas for him. And my spirit said, just say, Lord bless you and move on your way. And I obeyed the Lord. I believe right now that the Lord is trying to talk to us about thinking properly about him. And I want you to come to this altar, anybody who wants to. One of the ways of having a love affair with God is to be closer to him in the closest areas. An altar was created and in the Bible, according to God, to be close to him. Many people like to stay in their seat. And, and, and you, you know, you're still in the house of God. But if you really wanted to be closer to him, that's what the altar is for. And I'm going to start talking about that in the future. Sunday, I'll be talking about that. Mm, Jesus. Let our minds be transformed. Let us be changed by God. Let us learn to think and act differently based on how we feel. Let our feelings change based on how we think. Jesus, let us be transformed. Let us be conformed to your word and to your thinking. Let us not use our own thinking and say, I'm right with God because I'm close or I've done some of what he asked. Let's not rationalize and justify poor behavior, but to say, God, I'm going to really live for you and, and, and take an honest look at my behavior and my life and my actions. We bow our hearts. Jesus. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. Jesus. We turn our
Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. We're just going to end with a prayer, if that's all right. Jesus, we just are in a position of needing to be a people that can't get enough of you. Our attitude should be this, just if I can get any more of God, I'm going to do what I can to be more, to get more, to be closer to him. God, let us get home safe. Let us keep these words in our mind as we go through our daily routines. And let us get back to the house of Lord on Sunday, ready to continue our revival. In Jesus' name, and the church said amen. amen. Someone clap on to the Lord. In Jesus' name, you are dismissed. <laughs>